one great American woman never ceases to study the international scene. The National Broadcasting Company is honored to present a conversation with Eleanor Roosevelt, archetype of the 20th century woman. With Mrs. Roosevelt appears William Atwood, foreign editor of Look magazine. Even after all these years, Mrs. Roosevelt, the UN still has a lot of critics. Um, lots of people feel, perhaps because they expected too much, that it's never developed into anything more than a debating society. What do you think about that? Well, it seems to me that some people have expected too much. They thought that just signing a charter meant that uh, peace was with us without any further effort on our part. And of course, anyone who really thinks about it knows we'll have to work for peace as hard as we ever worked to win a war and much longer. But I think without the UN, we might very well have had World War III. And it seems to me that looking around the world today, in the first place, the Secretary General's position has become a much more important one. He's become a, a great negotiator and someone um, who has a great influence with the heads of state. Well, Mrs. Roosevelt, we've been outside looking at the changes in the landscape along the East River. And uh, you've seen a lot of changes, not only in the American landscape, but in the American life and society during this past half century. In your youth, Mrs. Roosevelt, uh, of course, women were not as active professionally as they are today. But wasn't there a certain sense of noblesse oblige, let's say, among the privileged classes? Uh, a sense of duty and of service to the community? You see, it was an entirely different setup. People who had um, certain advantages of birth and of money and so forth um, had an obligation to be kind to the poor. And who had an obligation, I can remember it very distinctly um, in the Hudson River Society, which was very strictly set, so to speak. Uh, my mother-in-law had a great sense of obligation, but uh, it was the obligation that my grandmother also had. Um, um, you, you had more, therefore you must uh, help those who had less. And um, there was a sense of noblesse oblige, of uh, obligation to help. But it was all on a different basis. There was no sense that people had a right, which was inherent in them as people, to have a decent opportunity to live decently and to um, have the opportunity for their children to grow up strong and healthy and, and have opportunities to develop to the maximum of their abilities. That, of course, as a an inherent right had never crossed their minds. Uh, but as I remember, in your youth, you yourself were not too sympathetic to women's suffrage. I what? took no interest in women's suffrage at all until um, after I was married and my husband was in favor of women's suffrage and I had a lot of little children, so I was not very active. But um, finally, I was persuaded that Women's suffrage was something that one needed to obtain many of the things that I already believed in, but that had not thought of at all, because I was not brought up. <laughs> it, it sounds odd, but my mother's family was entirely outside of politics, and I was brought up by my mother's mother, my, grand, my maternal grandmother. And I had no particular ideas that were political at all, all but... Um, uh, I did, of course, take an interest in my uncle, Theodore Roosevelt, but it was a very distant and unpolitical interest. I knew that he was uh, uh, in politics, and, but I think I hardly would have known what it was to be either a Democrat or a Republican in those days. <laughs> well, that's, of course, that's something that's in, in, intrigued many people. 
uh, in as much as nearly all the Roosevelt's, if not all, were Republicans in those days, how did you become a Democrat? What induced oh, you to... Oh, no, you're quite wrong. They were not. Um, originally, the Roosevelt's were all Democrats. Then in the Lincoln Civil War days, most of them became Lincoln Republicans. I see. And then uh, the Theodore Roosevelt stayed Republicans. Um, my husband's family went back to its original Democratic affiliations, and even uh, Theodore Roosevelt's father, Theodore Roosevelt Sr., his brother went back to being a Democrat. And you will find that most of the Roosevelt's of that day went back to their early affiliations. Do you think that uh, Teddy Roosevelt would be a Democrat if he were alive today? Oh, I haven't any idea. <laughs> uh, but um, he, he, of course, if you remember, uh, made a great many uh, enemies in the Republican Party of his day. The same type of thing was said about Theodore Roosevelt as uh, later was said uh, about my husband. People remember him and his vigor, his energy, his advocacy of the strenuous life. Do you uh, remember him as being this kind of man? Did he live up to this reputation for boundless energy? Oh, yes, he was very active. Of course, as a young man, he went out and had a ranch in the Dakotas, and he lived there a very strenuous uh, life. And he loved sports. He loved shooting. He loved any kind of exploration. You remember how many trips he went on just to find new lands and see new areas of the world. So that I think he had the kind of explorer spirit. And to do that, you have to have stamina and you have to have vigor. And then it was not only physical vigor. There was also great vigor of the mind. And he could read faster than anyone I remember. And he read voraciously, he read everything he could lay his hands on. Of course, he preferred certain things. I remember as a child that he always uh, would read aloud on rainy days up in what was known as the gun room, which was his own special retreat at Sagamore where he wrote. And he would read to the assembled children the old Norse sagas, and which would fit into his particular liking. But he, he read everything. At the same time, he had plenty of time left over for, for practicing politics. Oh, well, I think that everything he did played into um, government interests and, and politics. He was, and he enjoyed it. I think it was um, as much a game, um, perhaps a relaxation in some ways. In this respect, was he uh, similar to your husband? Yes, in that respect. My husband enjoyed politics. He enjoyed the matching of wits with other people. And um, it, was, it was also a game. And, and um, I, I think he enjoyed it very much. Mrs. Roosevelt, during the 12 years that you spent in the White House, you did a great many things that were not expected of presidents' wives. You read, you traveled a great deal, you lectured, you made speeches, and you were criticized, you were harshly criticized. Do you think that uh, some of this criticism was due to the fact that you were the wife of a, of a president who was always a controversial figure, or was it due to the fact that uh, you were doing things that no first lady had ever done before? Well, I think it was largely because I was doing things that had not been done before. Um, I think my husband was really very long-suffering and very good because uh, he never tried to keep me to the pattern. It's, it's obvious that a first lady must do her own um, social life in the White House. That's part of the obligation of being there. Uh, and of course, I had no young children at home anymore. And my husband knew that uh, perhaps if I didn't do something, um, it would be rather a difficult life. And so he made no objections when I was offered lecture trips. And I used to go for three weeks every spring, and three weeks every autumn. And it gave me the opportunity to see what 
uh, the results were of things that were being done and by the government. And while he had all the information in the world, um, perhaps it was a little more um, an addition to uh, what he would hear in any other way. And that was, was very useful. Then, of course, um, my husband, I think, uh, hated to curtail other people's liberties. And I remember very well on the anti-lynching bill, bill uh, which was up at that time, um, that Walter White uh, came down and asked him once. And he explained that he could not make uh, that bill a must because he had to have the Southern votes for uh, what he considered a priority, uh, rearmament and getting ready in case you had to meet a war. And <clears throat> so uh, I said, uh, well, now I feel very strongly about the anti-lynching bill. You say you're not sure it's constitutional. Perhaps it isn't, but I feel that, that uh, it should pass if, if the public can talk about it. And uh, he said, well, I didn't say that you had to take any special stand. You do what you think is right. And um, on one other occasion, um, I asked him about something. And he said, well, I can always say I can't do anything with my wife. <laughs> Looking back now to those years that you were in Washington, what do you consider today to be the greatest uh, achievements, the greatest accomplishments of your husband as president? I would say that... Um, um, important things were the, the taking affirmative action to meet the depression and give people back their own sense of self-confidence. Uh, without uh, that, there was really no, um, no way in which the people would have been ready to meet the strain of the war. And so I think possibly that was one of the... Um, greatest things he did for our country and our people. Then, of course, in the war, um, the courage to decide on um, things that had to be done when you didn't know what the outcome would be, such as the um, carrying on of, of uh, the discoveries that the Germans had started in the atomic field. Um, there was no knowledge, of course, of what would happen. But you had to decide whether you would uh, do it or not. And I, th I think that um, many of those decisions uh, were very great decisions. And basic uh, to a lot of these, of course, was the ability to <coughs> communicate with the people oh, that <coughs> so that they understood was the need. That was a gift from God. That... Uh, that he had. Uh, did he make, uh, do you consider that he made any great mistakes? Yes, I think he respect? made mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. I think he made mistakes in um, uh, trying to do something uh, in the reform of the judicial system too soon when people were not, uh, usually his timing sense was a remarkable thing. But I think both in that and in uh, trying to interfere as president in certain elections at one point, um, was a mis those two were the big mistakes, I think, that he made. In, uh, in those last hectic years during the war, I was wondering whether, uh, was there any time at which you uh, could anticipate that he was not going to live out his last term? Well, of course, he showed the strain of, of uh, the years in the White House, uh, but none of us ever felt that he wasn't going to be able to go on. I think he was such a vital person and so convinced himself that um, when the doctors told him that if he was careful, he could carry the responsibilities, that he must take a certain amount of rest and so forth, that um, I don't think any of us, we knew he looked very badly, we knew that he was much more tired, but nevertheless we had this great sense of his uh, 
power of making himself do things. And um, none of us really realized, I think, the, the to what extent. Had run, had run out. Yes. Mr. Roosevelt, during that spring of 1945, uh, many people close to the president, including yourself, apparently did not realize that he had finally run out of his inexhaustible vitality. And in this connection, I wonder whether you feel uh, that we need legislation to provide for a situation uh, where a president becomes clearly incapacitated. I don't know that we need legislation. Perhaps we do. But I think we do need to clarify the succession, the responsibility for who takes over and how that is accomplished when necessary. And then it's the question of who decides when a president is incapacitated. I think it must be a group of doctors, if possible doctors, uh, that have absolutely no political taint of any kind or and who cannot who have the confidence of uh, their own profession and of the public that they cannot be influenced in any way a, and if you could have a group of such doctors they would be the obvious ones to make the final decision mrs roosevelt had your husband lived out his term do you think our relations with the russians uh, would be any different than they are today, or do you think the Cold War was inevitable? Well, that's very difficult to tell. As you know, after Yalta, both he and Mr. Churchill were very much disappointed in the way promises that Stalin had made to them were being carried out, and both of them sent very severe messages. Um, whether that would have changed, my husband had a very great confidence in his personal ability to contact people and win them over or make a dent, to make them understand whether he would have felt that on that basis he could have um, accomplished something in spite of Stalin's quite evidently not living up to his first promises. Um, I don't know. Yes, and uh, many people feel that they are making more headway uh, in the world with their views than we are with ours. And I was wondering whether you felt that way and whether you thought that, say, a generation from now, the Soviet way of life or way of looking at life will predominate or whether the democratic way will predominate. Well, I am hopeful that we, particularly if we go there in sufficient numbers and intelligently enough, will realize that in the first place they are selling um, something that actually doesn't exist because they are selling to uncommitted nations their material successes and um, they're selling those to people to whom material successes along those lines are enormously important. They show them what they've accomplished in 40 years in medicine. They don't tell them how it's accomplished. Oh, and uh, except to say, we can help you with technicians, we can help you with doctors, we can help you with public health people. And um, that's, that's a promise that they're very uh, glad to fulfill because they have um, graduated more and more people in the areas which would be useful in these countries that they want to dominate. Well, can you tell me why Washington isn't full of these people uh, watching uh, democracy at work or out at River Rouge watching capitalism at work? You and I have both been to Moscow. Uh, the city is full of Indonesians and Burmese and people from Africa, all marveling at the synthetic wonders of the Soviet world. Why uh, isn't Washington full of these people? Why aren't we showing off our way of life to them? Well, because those that you saw in Moscow uh, were invited by the government. They were entertained by the government. Little things were thought of to give them pleasure. Um, our government has always felt that it was, we lived in a free country. Anyone who wanted to come could come. Now we don't allow communists to come without special permission, but 
um, other people can come. But aren't the communists the very people who should be coming? Oh, yes, of course, but that hasn't dawned upon... Uh, Mr. McCarty did us harm that way. Uh, it hasn't dawned upon people that actually we're strong enough to allow the communists to come and to show them what we have a value to show. A real campaign is being put on by the Soviet Union. They invite people, they entertain them, they provide them with young and attractive interpreters who come out of their universities and have had the chance to learn any of the languages they want because in their language institutes they teach 43 languages. And as you know, you remember, that the first three rows in every place of entertainment in the Soviet Union are kept for sale to foreigners. Right. And of course, government invited guests get those best seats, but anyone can come off a plane, and if they're a foreigner, they can buy the best in the first three rows of the house for anything, for opera, for, for ballet, for whatever is good. Well, now, these are very pleasant things. It's sort of an irony, isn't it, that we who really cultivated this art of salesmanship, and we've been able to merchandise everything from soap to even to presidential candidates, that we're being beaten at our own game, really, by, by the Russians. Well, I think one reason is that, of course, this requires the cooperation of Congress for the government to invite people on this scale means Congress has to participate. And Congress does not believe what I believe. I believe that the people of this country not only would understand, but could understand the need. But Congress doesn't think so. Do you feel, Mrs. Roosevelt, in your conversations with the Russians at the UN uh, and in the Soviet Union, that they have given up uh, the idea of war as an instrument of policy? I think they've ruled out a nuclear war for the simple reason that they realize that they couldn't with one blow wipe out all possibility of retaliation. And they know that if there was retaliation, they would be as much hurt as we would be. And they want a world that is a going concern. Doesn't mean anything to them to have a world in ruins. Exactly. And therefore, um, they really are cleverer than we are at having set their objective. Khrushchev said to me, it may take 50 years, but the law of the future is communism, and we are to have a communist world. Now, if you're that convinced, and you said it with great conviction, um, and you've decided that you're going to do it, not through war, but through other ways, uh, then you put all your thinking into how it's to be done. Now, we never think to tell our young people anything like this. We don't make them feel that this is part of a great um, undertaking to keep the world a non-communist world. Part of living, uh, part of living in the mid 20th century, really. Yes. In this contest for men's minds that we've been talking about, it does seem that we've been outwitted for a good many years by the Russians. I don't mean just uh, we in America, but the West. And this raises the question of whether uh, there's been a crisis of leadership in the West. If you look around, you'll see that the really big leaders, uh, the, the, the Churchills, the Adenauers, the Nehru's, are getting old, and they don't, there don't seem to be younger men coming up and taking their place. I wonder if you have any thoughts about this. Hey, I think there are, uh, particularly in this country, some... Uh, big leaders developing, and um, but they're still young, and we have the drawback in this country of having only lately come to a position where maturity is required of us. Uh, for a great many years, Great Britain had it, and uh, now uh, we suddenly find ourselves, instead of putting all our energies into developing our own country, to have to put our energies into still solving our own problems, but in the context of the world's problems. And uh, that's something new for us. And our young people who are now in the leadership uh, field uh, are still struggling to get a world point of view, a real knowledge of the world as a whole, and to see every problem as it comes up in its relation 
to the rest of the world and what will happen. That's very hard for a, a young nation still to see and accept. And I think that's our difficulty in leadership. Now, it isn't in the countries of Europe, but those countries were very much hurt in the war, in the generation that now has come to leadership. Many of the men uh, were in concentration camps. Many of the men suffered physically and mentally and spiritually. And it will take time for a new generation, really, to grow up that has the self-confidence needed for leadership. Would you, Ms. Roosevelt, urge young people in their 20s, say, to enter government service at this point? Well, there was a point a few years ago where I emphatically would have said no, because I thought that we had lost our sense of really wanting people to think freely for a while. This was the McCarthy period, so-called yes. period in American yes. history. But now I would say um, yes again. And very, very much would I like to see uh, gifted young people going into government service. But I think we must get over as a country the desire to see conformity. We must allow the young people of today uh, to develop and to think over a wide field, even if we disagree with them. We, we develop for a short time a strange phenomenon for us, uh, namely that uh, you couldn't change your mind. If at 18 you'd happened uh, to even glance at communism with interest, uh, you were doomed. You were going to be a communist forever. Now, that's just perfect nonsense and something that would not have happened uh, years ago oh, in our country where our people tolerated all kinds of thinking and of expression of thought. When did this happen and what do you suppose it was? Well, it may have been our... Um, uh, concentration on gaining material things. It may have been that we were obliged to do that. And then gradually as we did it, and they became more and more important, um, we, we put too much value on it and lost our real sense that the contribution that mattered was the intellectual and moral and spiritual contribution of a character, a great character. Because when you think back, our great people were the people uh, not who died leaving um, much money, but who died leaving an inheritance to the country, like Jefferson, like Patrick Henry, like any number of people. Really here in America, um, there are very deep spiritual values and um, very high standards for uh, morality, really, in... Um, the people as a whole. And I think that um, we have perhaps counted uh, too much on material things and been too proud of our acquisition of material comforts quickly. But um, we know, I think, pretty well what are the real values in our lives. And I think that I think we always, when we know that there is something that has to be met, you nearly always find that the American people, once they understand it, will face up to it and meet it. The National Broadcasting Company has presented a conversation with Eleanor Roosevelt. With Mrs. Roosevelt appeared William Atwood, the conversation was filmed in the Carnegie Building, which overlooks the United Nations. In this building is located Mrs. Roosevelt's office with the American Association for the United Nations.